Okay. And so I hope all of you had a wonderful uh, Christmas uh, with family, with friends. Hopefully you had, had a, a nice big meal with some people. But I hope you've had, had, had a good, good time. But how many of you guys have ever heard of this phenomenon called the post-Christmas blues? Anyone ever, ever hear of this? And, and it's, it's kind of due to this. Christmas, more than any other holiday, has like the longest buildup of all holidays, doesn't it? Like, like when 4th of July rolls around, it's like, oh yeah, that's, that's coming up in a couple of days. Uh, do you want to go see fireworks? And I should put a hot dog in my face. But like Christmas... It's like, it's like as soon as the back-to-school poster comes down from Walmart, you walk in one day, and there's Santa Claus like telling you about Christmas, and you're like, wait, it's, it's September, right? Like, I'm still wearing shorts and flip-flops, and, and, and there's a commercial on TV about this holiday season. I'm like, this holiday season, and there's this big, long buildup, right? Like, the advertisers start on it way early, like June, July. I don't know when they start. It feels like it's earlier every year. I'm waiting, I'm waiting for the year to, like, it'd be New Year's, and they're like, hey, coming up this Christmas, you know, buy such and such. But it gets earlier every year. And even if you don't, you know, even if you could tune out all the commercialism hype, I mean, let's be honest, like, once Black Friday hits, like, it's full-on Christmas everywhere. Like, and we're thinking about preparing for it. You start getting messages from family members about, hey, we need lists from your kids. And, and you start making all the holiday plans. And, hey, when are we going to, to, to this family member's house and this party? And, and, and works letting you know about Christmas parties. And there's this huge, long buildup, right? And then you get to Christmas and it comes, and, and all the excitement passes, right? There's no more gifts to open. There's no more Christmas parties to go to, and life begins to settle down into its normal routine. And for some people, that's, that, that's, that's a hard transition because it's like it was excitement and Christmas and holidays and, and lights and, and, and all this nostalgia. And then, then you have January, and, and the weather stinks, and, and, and there's, there's nothing exciting, and, and, and there's this, this sense of, of letdown, right? And, and I think the... the, the the main reason we, we feel that, that post-Christmas blues sometimes is because we lose sight, we lose touch, we get distracted from, from the main point of why we celebrate Christmas, right? Like we celebrate Christmas because our Heavenly Father gave humanity the greatest gift in the history of all gifts through His Son, and we celebrate that. You know why we give gifts on Christmas? No, not because the advertisers told us we have to and the evil, you know, henchmen of commercialism are at work. No, we do that because we celebrate receiving the greatest gift ever by giving to each other and, and being generous and reminding ourselves of the generosity of our God. But when we get caught up in the activity... We get ourselves set up for disappointment when all of the fanfare and hype has settled down. And I want to talk this morning as we look at, at starting a new year, 2020, at another, another scenario where we, where we have this, this post-experience blues or this, this letdown. And it happens often when we have spiritual experiences, spiritual encounters with God. We have a moment, maybe... maybe um, it happens in an environment like this one in a church service, or maybe it happens outside of church. But in any case, we have this spiritual high, and then we come down off of it, things start to settle back down normal. Very similar to like when, when Christmas wraps up, and all of a sudden, okay, my house is no longer decorated with, with lights and all that stuff. It's getting normal. And we have this letdown. And so I remember, you know, I've shared this before on the platform. You know, I, I grew up in church, spent, spent you know, my, my childhood growing up in church. And I remember as a teenager... Um, I was invited uh, by some friends who, who went to another, another church to go to this, this youth conference with them. And this conference was designed just for, just for high school students, just for youth. And, and it was called Acquire the Fire. Tell me that doesn't sound like it's made for teenagers. But anyway, we went to this conference, me and a few other friends from our church. And, and this, was, this was a big, big moment in my life personally, because even though I had grown up in church, that was the first moment where it got, my relationship with Jesus got very real and very genuine for me. I mean, I'd grown up in it, I'd believed it, it was something that, that was a part of the fabric of our lives and our family, but at that moment, I experienced something different. And I wasn't the only one. We, we came back from this, this weekend conference, everyone was fired up, ready to, to worship God, like it was, it was a whole new thing. And I still rem remember to this day, the youth pastor at our church, I mean, his, his, his heart was in the right place. His timing was probably terrible. But, but kind of telling us right off the bat, hey, listen, this, this spiritual high is not going to last. And I remember thinking, you're the youth pastor. 
You're supposed to be excited about this. What's wrong with you? And, and he meant well. He just wanted to let us know, hey, listen, this, this roller coaster can't stay at the top forever. You're, you're going to come down off this emotional high. And even though his timing and delivery on the message stunk, it was absolutely true. And many of you have had similar experiences, right? Maybe you're sitting in the seat today in this, in this church because of an experience. Maybe you came to, to Hub City and you experienced the love of Jesus for the first time and, and it changed your life dramatically. But now things have settled back in to the normal routine of life. Or, or maybe, maybe you come in here and, and, and you've experienced uh, God's, God's miraculously healed you. That's many of your stories, I know, where God, God physically healed something in your body, did a miracle in your, in your body, and, 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 and that was amazing. And life has now settled back down into normal and routine. Or maybe you just came in here and, 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 and you experienced the presence of God and, and worship. And, and, and you didn't know what was going on, but you're, you're crying, you're tearing up. And you're like, I'm not even a crier. And I don't know what's going on, but I think I'm going to come back to that church place. <laughs> I don't know what your experience is, but eventually... Life settles back down into a normal routine. Or maybe it didn't even happen in a context like this, in a church service. But maybe you've just picked up and noticed all the ways that God has been active in your life. And, and, and it's moved you deeply to know that the creator of the universe cares about you and cares about the details of your life. And that experience for you has been transformative. Or maybe God's recently given you a promise or a dream, or a vision for your future. Whatever God encounter, God experience that you've had, we all know what it's like to come off of that mountaintop, right? To come down from, from that, that, that enthusiasm, that excitement, and life begins to settle back into its routine and habit. And slowly but surely, things feel the same way they did before. We don't feel the same energy or emotion we don't seem to be hearing God's voice as frequently or as clearly. And because things don't feel the way that they used to when we are in the middle of that spiritual high, we make some incorrect assumptions. Now, the Bible is pretty clear that all of our days are not going to be the spiritual version of Christmas Day, okay? Every day is not going to be, there's, there's lots of verses in the Bible about the rain falling on the just and the unjust. You know, Jesus makes a promise to us that in this life you will have trouble. Like the Bible does not paint this picture that, that coming to Jesus is going to make your life all gumdrops and flowers, right? Like it talks about hard times. So when we come to these moments in life, when, when the emotion has, has faded, we, we kind of fall, I'm going to put us kind of in, in three broad responses, uh, our categories of responses, if you will, when we come down from a spiritual experience or, or an emotional high. The first one's this. We can tell ourselves, you know what? I just caught, it, caught up in the moment, man. I'll tell you what. You put me in a room with a hundred other people all singing about, that is who you are, that is who you are. And I, I just got caught up in the, you know what? That was not real. That was just, I got caught up in the hype and now that life settled down, I know that that wasn't really going on. There wasn't anything amazing about that. I just got caught up in the hype. Or, or maybe our response causing we fall into another category. We say, you know what? No, I know it was real. But those spiritual experiences, they must be like special occasions. Like these things don't happen every day. And, and I just need to count myself lucky when I have them, like winning the lottery, like, you know, the odds aren't real great that you're going to have a bunch of these moments, but when you do, just enjoy it and appreciate it for what it is. Or maybe you fall into a different camp, the third, third kind of area. I know, I know that that experience was real, but to see that kind of stuff happen in your life all the time, you have to be really, really spiritual. Like, you got to be in tune with God, and I'm not, I don't know, how, I don't know what that looks like. Like, I don't know if you have to, like, do some kind of special spiritual retreat or be, there's, there's something and I, I, whatever it is, it's not me. But just like people who experience the post-Christmas blues have lost the reason for Christmas, we often lose sight of the reason for our spiritual experience. So I want to ask you guys, what if we are missing something Hugely important when it comes to how we approach our spiritual experiences and the spiritual highs we may experience. What if we're looking at it all wrong? What if we have missed the whole point? And what if your 
spiritual experience is not just about you. He said, John, what do you mean? It's my experience. How could it not be about me? It's, it is about you. It's partly about you, but it's not only about you. And I want you to imagine, or I want to challenge you this morning, to what if every time we had a powerful encounter with God, we began asking the question, who can I share this with? Because we have to give it away. And the first fill in the blank on your outline is this. And if you don't remember anything else, please remember this. God's Spirit will not flow in us. He will only flow through us. And that kind of sounds like the same thing, but it's not. God's Spirit will not flow in you. He will only flow through you. And let me explain what I mean by this. I'm going to put a, put a map up on the screen. Uh, there, there's a, a sea called the Dead Sea over in the Middle East. And it's actually not a sea at all. It's actually a lake. But the Dead Sea is the, is the lowest elevation body of water on planet Earth. It's actually several hundred feet below sea level. And because it is so low, as you can see on the map here, the Jordan River, which is a fresh water river, runs into the Dead Sea, but the Dead Sea has no outlets. Nothing goes out of the Dead Sea because it's so low. And so everything runs into it, nothing runs out of it. And even though there is fresh water that can produce and sustain life, you know why it's called the Dead Sea? Because it has no outlets. All of, of the salt and minerals that are in the water, they stay there. And as the water evaporates, the minerals are left behind. And the salt content in the Dead Sea is so high that people go there. It's, a, it's kind of a, 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 a tourist attraction, if you will, because you can get in that water and, and basically float effortlessly. Because the, the, the salt content in the Dead Sea is actually higher than, than the salt content in, in the oceans. And nothing living can be in the Dead Sea. There's no plant life. There's no fish. There's, there's nothing living in that body of water because it has no outlet. And it's a perfect illustration of your life and my life because God may be pushing fresh, life-giving water into you. But if we don't allow the water to flow through us, if we only allow it to flow in us, the very thing that was intended to produce and reproduce life and, and refreshment and energy and newness instead dies and produces nothing in us. And the more that you and I focus on ourselves and, 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 and we, we have an experience with God and we're like, okay, God, wow, that was great. What's the next thing that's going to happen with me? And we look inward, God, what do you want to do in me? And we look inward and we pray in these prayers, God, what do you want to do with me? And, 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 and it's me, it's me, it's me, it's me. The more we look inward, the more we cut off the flow of what God wants to do in our lives. Because the God's Spirit's not going to work in us. He will only work through us. And so we allow the flow of God's Spirit when we do things like serve other people without an agenda or when we give generously, or live generously, when we love people, especially difficult people. Basically, anytime we engage with others in a manner that reflects our Savior, Jesus, we are allowing God's Spirit to flow through us. And one of the simplest ways that we can allow God's Spirit to flow, not just in us, but through us, is, to by, is by sharing what God's doing in us, by telling our story. And so I want, to, I, want to, I want to take us back into the Old Testament this morning, and we're going to look at, at what God said to the nation of Israel right after one of their spiritual encounters, one of their spiritual highs. Because God knows that it's important for you and I to share what He's doing in us. And so we're going to look at Joshua chapter 4, but before I read the, read the verse, just to give you a little bit of background, this is uh, before Israel has has received their inheritance and been established as a, as a physical nation on earth. So they've been taken out of Egypt by God's miraculous hand, the plagues, right? Let my people go. Ten Commandments movie, maybe you've seen it. 
or uh, what's the other one, Prince of Egypt. I can't remember what it was called. Anyway, they made a cartoon one. It was pretty good too. But they, they've been delivered from oppression and slavery in Egypt. God's, God's led them to the place where, where he said, hey, this is going to be your permanent place for your nation to reside and grow and flourish. And so they get to the Jordan River. And it's this time of year that the, that the Jordan River was in full flood stage. And I don't know if you remember a couple summers ago when the Potomac River, we had all that rain, and it just felt like that, that it would never, ever stop raining. Like some, some of you started building arcs because you're like, hey, I've heard this before. I'm going to get ready. But it just rained and rained and rained and rained. And the Potomac River is like 60 times wider than it's supposed to be, and everything's flooded. That's what it's like. And you got to remember, like, this is, this is before, like, you know, hey, we're going to have a bunch of uh, boats and build a bridge. And th- this is an entire nation of people, women, children, livestock, animals, stuff on carts. Like, you're not just, like, swimming across this thing. You're talking about, you know, millions of people trying to cross a river, and it seems like an impossibility. It's like, how are we supposed to do what God's telling us to do with this giant obstacle in our way? And so God tells tells Joshua, the leader of, of Israel at that time, he says, tell the priests to carry the Ark, Ark of the Covenant, the, the box that they, they had that represented God's presence, God's spirit. They say, tell them to walk out into the river first. And as, as the priests walk into the river, something miraculous happens. The water upstream just begins to stack up. Like, like there's just a giant piece of plexiglass there holding it all back, and it just keeps getting higher and higher and higher. And, and as, that, as the river stops flowing to that point, they're able to walk across on dry land. So the priests are there carrying the presence of God in the middle of the riverbed. It's drying out. Women, children, donkeys, sheep, cattle, the whole nine yards. Whole nation's crossing, right? This big event. And so we pick it up in Joshua chapter 4 after this, this miracle has happened. And it says this, When all the people had crossed the Jordan River, the Lord said to Joshua, Now choose twelve men, one from each tribe. Tell them, Take 12 stones from the very place where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan. Carry them out and pile them up at a place where you will camp tonight. So Joshua called the 12 men he had chosen, one from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. He told them, go into the middle of the Jordan in front of the ark of the Lord your God. Each of you must pick up one stone and carry it on your shoulder. 12 stones in all, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. We will use these stones to build a memorial. So Joshua sees God miraculously lead the entire nation across this river in the middle of, of a flood, flood stage, flood season. And it's no coincidence to me that immediately on the heels of this miracle, God speaks to them. God speaks to Joshua and says, listen, I want you to have them gather stones and we're going to build a monument to remember this by. And, and if you look here, in verse 5, it says, He told them, go in the middle of the Jordan, each of you pick up a stone, and carry it out on your shoulder. Okay, so you got to remember, okay, we're not talking about like 12 softballs, right? Like they're building a memorial to, so that every time they walk by this particular location where they camp that night, they will be reminded of what God did. They will be reminded of the miracle. So you're talking about big stones are carrying on the shoulder. So this is not convenient, right? Carrying stones out of the river it's, it's not convenient, but it was so important. And you got to remember, like, this has been a long day, right? Like, it's not a hundred people crossing a river. It's millions. Like, have you, I mean, come on. Some of you have experienced the, the monumental effort it took to get yourself and your children out of your house this morning. And it was like, come on, we got to go. Come on, we got to go. Come on, we got to go. Have you brushed your teeth? No. Go brush your teeth. You know, I, are you dressed? Yes. And we have your coat. And, and it's this big, big deal, right, for you to get five people out of your house, right, or four or six, or how many people are in your family. Can you imagine an entire nation of people? Keep it moving. Please keep it moving. Keep it moving. These poor priests have been standing there all day carrying the ark of God. And so at the end of all this, trust me, the most convenient thing was not like, hey, now that we've got everyone across, listen, I need 12 of you guys to go back and find the biggest rock you can heft it up out of the river, climb up out of the riverbank, and we're going to build a, build a, a memorial here. It wasn't convenient. And let me tell you that telling your story will not always be easy or convenient, but it is important. So write that in your outline on this blanks. Telling your story is not always easy, but it is important. 
Think about this. Joshua, com- or I'm sorry, God commanded Joshua. This was important enough that God said, you need to do this. You need to remember this. You need to make a memorial. And you know what? Today, we do, we do memorials through other, other means. We can, we can make a memorial through a, a post on social media. We make a memorial by having a conversation with somebody else telling our story. We make a memorial by, by sharing what God has done through us, through action and deed. But this was their way. They left their mark on this area. Another thing that I, that I think is important to point out is they recorded this miracle. They made this monument out of rocks. Wild miracle was fresh in their memory. They did it immediately. And so telling your story is a way to remind yourself of God's faithfulness. Now, I know that you guys probably don't forget lots of stuff, but I have been told on occasion that I forget things by people in my family and people I work with. But we do. We have a tendency to forget stuff, don't we? We all do. We, we forget so easily, so easily what God has done in the past. And, and one of the things that, that I've, I've learned to do that has helped me tremendously is, is to keep a, a journal of the things where, where God speaks to me or where God moves on my behalf. And I write these things down when they're fresh, when they're happening. And then when I have a moment of doubt, like all of us do, when I have a moment when I feel like God has abandoned me, when you have that moment where you're frustrated and you don't know what to do or what's going on next and you feel like you're praying but God's not saying anything, I crack that thing open and I'm like, no, God did this. And then God did that. And I remember when God did this. And this is exactly what the nation of Israel did here. They piled up the, these rocks and made a monument where they came. And, and you've got to know that every time anybody who was there walked by and saw those piles of rocks there as a memorial, they're like, man, I remember that. It brought them right back there. And they remembered what God had done. And even more importantly, it says this in verse 6. It says, we will use these stones to build, to build a memorial. In the future, your children will ask you, what's up with the big pile of rocks? And it says, you can tell them, they remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. When you tell your story, when you take a step and share what God's done in your life, you are making sure you will remind yourself of God's faithfulness because you will need that reminder down the road. And one more little point about telling your story I want to share is this. Letting your story out is a way to let more of God's Spirit in. And see, when you tell your story about what God has done in your life, when you share what God is doing in your life by serving others, when you do that, you're allowing others to borrow your faith. To borrow your faith. You say, John, what do you mean, borrow your faith? Well, I mean, like this. Every one of you sitting in these seats today, you're here, if you're in a relationship with Jesus this morning, that started with you borrowing someone else's faith. You didn't get here on your own. All of us stand on someone else's shoulders who, who their story or their act of faith was the spark or the jump start that engaged us and started our journey of faith, our relationship with Jesus. That's where it became real for us. So um, several years ago, uh, I, was, I was coming home, and it was, it was uh, dark. It was nighttime raining real hard, and if you're not familiar with Williamsport, I was coming off of the interstate exit, uh, merging onto Route 11 in Williamsport. And so it's, it's, it's downhill, and you got traffic from 11 coming down one way, people zooming off the interstate the other way. Well, well my, my uh, expedition just died right there, kind of right past where those, those lanes merge. And I mean, like, dead as a doornail died. All the electrical went out, car stopped. And for whatever reason, I could not get that sucker to go into neutral. Like, I could not get it to shift out of gear. It was stuck in, it was stuck in drive, and, and it, was, it was stuck there. I got the emergency brake on. I've got no lights, and I'm like, this is bad. Because if you know, if you're familiar with that little section of town, like, 
people come off that ramp faster than what we probably should, and I'm just as guilty as everybody else. But so I'm, I'm there, and so I'm like, okay, no one can see me. It's dark. It's raining. So I did what any reasonable man would do. I got the flashlight on my phone, and I'm doing this behind, <laughs> behind the truck so, so no one comes plowing into me. It didn't occur to me what would happen if they actually did, that I would be standing between me and the truck. But anyway, hindsight. So I'm there. And I, I call my wife. I'm like, hey, I, I need you to, 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 to come here and help me. I'm explaining the situation. She's like, this isn't cool at all. You need to find somebody else. Anyway, to, to shorten the story, and she was on her way. Don't, don't, don't hear me wrong. It wasn't like she was going to leave me there. She's like, my wife's not a fan of being put in, high, in situations like that, and, and who wouldn't be? I, but someone stopped. They said, hey, what's going on? I was like, hey, I, I need to jumpstart this thing to get it out of the traffic. Thankfully, a police officer came. He's got lots of light to, to, to make sure we're able to safely get my truck off there. Got it pulled into the McDonald's parking lot. And, and was able to, to eventually get my truck to a spot, jump it where I could get to a place where I could get it fixed, get it into a place of help. A jump start is what a vehicle needs sometimes, not to make it all better, but to get it to where it needs to be so it can become all better. And that is exactly what telling your story is like. That's what these spiritual experiences, these moments of high, they're often like jump starts for a car. It's not intended to be the engine of the car, and you can't go driving around town needing to jump everywhere you go. I mean, you can, and some of you have probably been in a situation where you've done that, but it's not a long-term fix, right? You do that enough times, you're eventually going to park your car somewhere where no one's going to be available to help you. And that's what it's like when we allow someone to borrow our faith. We give them the jump start that they needed to get out of their place of, of danger and destruction, just like my truck was there in the dark. And, it, and listen, it wasn't a question of if someone was going to hit me. And that precarious position, it was a matter of how long is it going to take before somebody hits me. And I needed that jump start to get to a place of health. And that's what, that's what those moments where you experience those spiritual highs, they're very much like jump starts. And those things are jump starts for other people if we share the story. If we tell others what God has done in our lives, that can be the spark that ignites their relationship with Jesus in someone else's life. And so you and I, it's not just, it's not just about what happens to us. It's about what's going to happen with others. And some of you right now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, listen, John, I don't really have a story to tell. Like, like I know some people, they, they've had these amazing experiences like, you know, God healed their, their foot or, or he healed them from cancer or they had this big experience where, where they, their, their life was, was in, in, in shambles and God put it back together. They've got such a great story. I, I just, you know, my, my story's not that important. Like, I'm just, I'm just kind of normal. Listen, you have a story to tell. And I know that we are all tempted to think our story is not worth telling, but that's simply not true. And I'll show you guys a video this morning of some regular, ordinary people telling their story about what God has been doing in their life recently here at Hub City. And, and let me tell you, there's no supernatural miracles in this story. No one is like, hey, you know, my, my leg grew out or, or I got cured from this or there's this, this, you know, completely unexplainable supernatural occurrence. But it is no less powerful and no less real what God is doing in their lives. So let's take a look. Hello, I'm Dwayne. My name's Tracy. Hi, I'm Mike, and this is my group story. Group story. This is my story. I started coming to HCV back in May. I loved the message, loved Chris, the old location on Bower Avenue. Um, I was good the weeks that my friend and his wife were there, but the weeks that they weren't, I didn't know anyone. So I'd come in, I'd sit in the back, you know, I'd listen to Chris, and I'd, I'd get up and leave. And one day I got talking to uh, somebody at work, telling them how, how much I love the church how great things were there and they asked me if I knew somebody and they said first and last name and I didn't know that I thought wow I've been going there for a year now and I know people but I, you know I meet great people in the hallways but I really didn't know anybody at that point. It had been a few years since I had been in a small group or a growth group and I was looking for something new. Mike and Liz had put up a video uh, 
about this group they were going to start called Run for God, and it was intriguing. There was a, a video for this group called Divorce Care, and that's exactly what I was going through. So when I saw that, I, I remember I immediately went home, emailed Mark, um, joined Divorce Care, and then uh, the group just I connected with that group. There, there's so much healing in that group. So to make a change in that, I decided I wanted to be more of a part of the team. And I thought like joining small groups and getting to know more people and, and know more about people and their last names and you know who I was attending church with, that, that would be a good first start. But as I, as I found out by going to different groups, uh, it's meant so much more to me than that. And it's changed my life in so many different ways that I mean, it's actually a privilege to sit here and share that with you today. It didn't matter who who was at group that day, somebody was beside me, um, running with me. I mean, people who run marathons were running with me, you know, just seasoned runners. Um, and, and it was great. I mean, there were some of us beginners, there were some that just ran, and everybody was together, and everybody was just supporting each other and just loving on each other. With joining groups, I've formed friendships and bonds with people, and I've met so many amazing people and people that on Sundays will come up and hug me and pray with me and things I didn't have before. I can feel God working um, through these people that I've met, just absolutely amazing. And bonds with people that I'm gonna carry on for, for years. And I would have never met that had it not been for the groups. So now after being in small groups for you know, approximately a year now, I've made you know, many new friends. I've uh, surrounded myself with a, a core group of people that, that believe in me, that support me. You know, we love one another, we support one another, we believe in each other. And it, it, it's just taken me from a, a place where I was just kind of idling through life to now I feel like I'm me again and, and I'm living my life again. Like some people's lives are changed from this group. Uh, I know my life has changed. My life was changed from the first go around and now it's changed even more from the second go of this group, so I can't wait to see what, what round three is going to hold. Before, I, you know, I always prayed and always, you know, considered myself a, a Christian, but it wasn't until, you know, this summer I started walking with God, and now I can actually see the difference, and my, my prayers are a lot different now than what they were before, because now I see God answering prayers, I see God working, I see know all the amazing things that he's doing. I just feel I'm a much stronger, um, confident person. My faith has grown. You know, I believe in myself and God so much more now as I sit here talking to you. This running group has been so much more to me, and now I get to firsthand witness even how much more it is to all the other people who joined round two. Um, I mean, I know the people in round one got a lot out of it, um, just spiritually. Um, they've gotten closer to God, I got closer to God, we got closer to each other. If you're on the fence about uh, joining a group, I, I was right there with you, but it was just something God put on my heart, and I just took the, the first step. So here's what I would say to anybody that's considering small groups, or at least you know, the thoughts going through your mind. You know, are you willing to stand on the sideline? I can tell you, like, I want more for you than that. I know HCV wants more for you than that. And most importantly, I know God wants more for you than that. Yeah. Simple stories. But I don't know about you, but when I hear that, when I hear them just talk about what God has done in their life, just by getting involved in a, in, a, in a group, that builds my faith. Because, you know, I mean, he said in the video, Mike said, you know, my, my prayers have changed. And I'm seeing God answer my prayers. And I'm seeing God move and be more active in my life. When we share what God is doing in our lives, we invite him to do more. And before we show the video, I said, you know, some of you are tempted to, to minimize or downplay your story. Oh, my story isn't that important. Listen, downplaying your story is downplaying God. When you minimize 
what, what, what God has done in your life. When you say it's not that big of a deal, it's insignificant, my story's not dramatic, my story's not miraculous, I don't really have anything to say. When you do that, you're not downplaying just yourself, you are downplaying God. Because your story is not just about you. Your story matters because it's part of God's story. And so don't fall into the trap of thinking, okay, no, this, this story is just for me, John, and, and this, this, is, this is, you know, it's my personal story. It's not meant to be sharing with other people. Listen, don't fall into the trap of assuming that personal always equals private. Okay? There are things in life that, that are private, but just because they're personal doesn't automatically make them private. Okay? So when you think about the context of sharing your story, sharing what God's doing in your life with other people, you need to think not personal like underwear that should not be shared with other people. You need to think personal like holiday meal which should be shared with others, right? Like I just last night at 9 o'clock finished off the last bit of turkey and stuffing that we had at our house on Christmas Day. When we have these big meals, that's a time that's just perfect to invite other people to join in. And even though it's personal, how many of you know having more people at the table often makes the experience that much more enjoyable? So personal is not always private. And, the, and don't downplay what God is doing in your life. And, and Jesus tells an entire parable just to illustrate this point of taking what God has done in us and using it and sharing it. And we often look at this, this parable and we think he's talking about money and resources and time, but really this parable is about anything that God has given to you, including your story. So we're going to pick it up at Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 and 15. Jesus starts in like this. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by a story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. Then he left on his trip. And to summarize the parable, the master's gone for a while. The guy with five bags, he, he, he does some deals, he does some investments. He turns those five bags of silver into ten. He doubles the investment his master made in him. The guy with two bags, he does the same thing. He invests it, gets a greater return on investment. The guy with one is, is scared that he's going to lose what, what the master had given him, so, so he, he buries it in the ground so he can account for every penny when his master returns. So the master returns from his trip. He comes back, guy with five bags. He's like, hey, I had five. You gave me ten. The master's like, that's amazing. You've been faithful. You've done well with what you've been given. I'm going to give you more. The guy with two bags, same story. You've been faithful. I'm going to give you more. Then we get to the guy with one bag who just held it in, who just buried it in the ground, who was so worried and held on so tightly, he was afraid he was going to lose something. He's like, listen, I know you are our, our guy of high expectations, master, and so here it is. And, and he proudly brings back, hey, here's the one bag of silver every coin accounted for. I didn't lose any of it, master. And Jesus' response says the master calls the guy wicked and lazy. Now, we often like to think about Jesus like like, I, 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 want to, I want to have a conversation with the come unto me, little children, Jesus, sit on my lap while I'm smiling, like that image. These are harsh words from Jesus. He says, wicked and lazy. Now, many of us don't have much of a problem calling people lazy, but if you ever call anyone wicked to their face, like, you're wicked. Those are harsh words to, to, that Jesus uses to illustrate how serious this was. And he wraps it up here in verse 29 of his parable. Jesus says this, To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. We all want to live a life of abundance, don't we? Like, that sounds good. Well, here's the thing. If you want to live a life of abundance, then you're going to need to share what God is doing in your life. Because Jesus lays out the principle for us in this parable. 
If you want God to do more in your life than what's happening right now, or if you want to see God continue to do what's happening in your life right now, then you'd better figure out how he wants you to share what he's doing in your life right now. You better figure out who you're going to tell your story to. You better figure out who you're going to serve. You better figure out how you're going to leverage what God has done in you to help someone else grow, to help someone else change. Because if you don't, the promise is clear. He says, even what you have is going to be taken away from you. And many of us, we've experienced this, right? And we've, we've grown maybe frustrated or even, even angry with God that, that we're not seeing him move in our lives the way we want him to. And yet, God's back looking at us saying, would you please do something with what I've given you? Because I can't trust you with more until you use what has already been put in your hands. And so, we'll put that first point we put up on the screen. God's Spirit will not flow in you. He will only flow through you. Now, simple question. Raise your hand. Have, have you seen God move in your life? Has God acted on your behalf? Yeah, a bunch of hands up, bunch of hands up. All right, well, we're going to close this service in the most practical way I know possible. I'm going to ask everyone to stand. I'm going to close the service in prayer. And we do this often in the Hub City, right? We, we pray for each other. You want to do this again? So one more time, I want you this morning, if you say, I, John, I, I want to see God do something. In my, I, I need a mountain moved in my life. There's something that, that, that I don't know how to handle that is beyond my ability. I need, I need God to move. Would you raise your hand because we want to pray with you this morning? So if that's you, put, just put one hand up real high. You say, I need God to move in my life this morning. I need an answer. I need God intervention. Okay, just keep your hand up. Now, a bunch of you guys raised your hand and said, I've seen God move a mountain in my life before. I've seen God do it. I want you to find someone with their hand up, introduce yourself and ask them how you can pray for them. Because God wants to use you and your faith. He wants to, to, to borrow a little bit of your faith to encourage and inspire someone else. So if you've got your hand up for prayer, leave your hand up real high until someone comes to pray with you. I want to make sure everyone has someone praying with them. And the band's going to just play a little, a little softly. I'm going to invite you guys to introduce yourself to them. Ask them how you can pray for them and then pray for them. So if someone's with you, please put your hand down. I need a lady over here on the right. And, and leave your hand, put your hand down when someone comes to pray with you. I want to make sure we get everyone covered. Is there anyone else with a hand up? Somebody's prayer. I need a lady over here on the right, please. Somebody step out. I know a bunch of you guys raised your hands. God's worked in your life. It's time to put it into action. Fantastic. Now, I'm not going to pray. They're going to pray. I'm going to invite the worship team to sing a little bit. And let's see what God does. praying, continue to do so. Well, we're going to close the service singing this chorus together. I've seen you move a mountain. I believe you'll do it again, but I want you to remember, he's going to do it again when you start sharing the story of the mountain he's moved in the past. When you step out, and there's a lot of practical ways you guys can do this. Get involved in a group where you're building relationships with other people. Go, go to our website and visit the story section and you can just upload a video off your cell phone of, of what God's done in your life and the video team will put it together and and, 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 and dress it up and, and edit it all together. It doesn't even have to be like a perfect take. 
but tell your story. Share what God is doing in your life with others around you because when you do that, you are releasing more of God's activity in your life. And if you want to grow, if you want to change, if you want to see God do more, then you're going to have to use what he has given you. So let's worship together as we leave this place and celebrate what God has done and what he is going to continue to do.